Hello, everybody. Good morning. It's so wonderful to see all of you. Um, this has been, a, a, I think, a really awesome series that we've been going through. Um, we've been reading the memoirs of Hak Jahan Moon, the wife of our founder, Reverend Moon, and you know his autobiography came out nine or eight, eight or nine years ago. And it was so awesome to kind of get a personal insight into what his life was like. And now we get the, the more personal insight into what her life is like. And, and there's so many parallels because they're married to each other. And, and in so many ways, they were one and sharing their life and sharing experiences. But there's something special we get from the perspective of the wife and the perspective of the mother and the perspective of the woman. So... Um, <coughs> Based on my readings from the book um, and her memoirs and her experiences, I want to talk about love and responsibility. And uh, on the one hand, I love that song so much. It's so simple. Love God and love people. That's what it all comes down to. Um, and I want to start off from a quote from our true mother's autobiography that I think gives a little bit more perspective into it as well. I love you. These are the sweetest words. They are the first words because through love, all life begins. But human beings can speak these words either responsibly or irresponsibly. God also gave animals the power to multiply through love. Animals search for a partner with whom to bear and raise offspring. But they differ from us in that for them, love is instinctual, and they are not responsible to make moral decisions related to love. For human beings, in contrast to animals, love is accompanied by responsibility. Love practiced with moral responsibility is what we call true love. So I just want to set the stage with that because in the English language, love can mean so many different things. I love these shoes. <laughs> I love my garden. Yeah. I love going to this restaurant. And I love you, and I love you, I love you, I love you. And in many languages, actually, there's different words for these different types of love. But in English, it's just love, and love is love. But, but true love is when there's a responsibility and a care that accompanies this love. I think we can easily fall into a trap of false love where we're chasing a feeling or we love in order to receive something for myself and it's actually selfish even though true love is the opposite. So just to, to set the stage, Love practiced with moral responsibility is what we call true love. And um, in the later chapters of, of Mother of Peace memoirs, there's a lot of recapping of all the different types of initiatives and programs and seminars and, and gathering together of people from we saw on the Peace Road the unity of the sciences, scientists from all over the world coming together on common grounds to, to develop a better world for humanity, um, things to do with nature, things to do with sports. And one of the sections that I was talking about, she was describing how they wanted to bring education to the world because I think we all agree that, you know, love and world peace and things are very important, but without a basic, the basic things, without food and without shelter and without education, then there's very little that can be done. So they actually poured so much effort and investment and money into providing education for people around the world and underprivileged communities. So I, I um, to kind of pull this along, I've got another quote talking along the point of education. My husband and I always supported the advancement of learning as an intrinsic good. 
There were times when we faced difficulties due to misconceptions that the Unification Church had objectives that would compromise the school's academic integrity. But our goal simply was to provide the highest education possible. We frequently invited celebrated scholars in all fields to deliver lectures. Sometimes we would spend tens of thousands of dollars for just an hour of expert training for our students. Father Moon respected the professors, although he really disliked it if they neglected the personal teacher-student dynamic in their classes. He emphasized that students are the proper ones to evaluate a professor's performance rather than academic colleagues or the school's administration. I loved this paragraph. Students are the proper ones to evaluate a professor's performance rather than academic colleagues or the school's administration. This reminded me of a conversation I had this week with, um, with a good friend of mine. She was one of my mentors on my missions program. And we're just sharing about the changes that are happening in our life and in the world and challenges we face in our relationships with the people that we're responsible for and the people who are supposed to be responsible for us. And she shared with, and she's really good friends with a, um, a Korean girl and she's trying to learn Korean. So whenever this Korean girl's father sends her texts, she often lets my friend try to read them and translate them into English. And one of the texts that this Korean girl's father sent her, as she translated it, it, it translated to something like this. That it's the parent's responsibility to inspire a filial heart in their children. And this person is not necessarily a member of our church or anything, it's just uh, his reflections on his life and his experience with his children, that it's it's my responsibility, it's a parent's responsibility to inspire the reciprocation of love or the filial heart from my children. And, and it, to me, it that's the first thing I thought of when I read this paragraph, that the ones to evaluate a professor's performance are the students. I think it's often, it's common for people in a leadership role or responsibility to kind of expect a certain amount of respect from the people that they're responsible for. If you're a boss and you ex expect respect from your, your, uh, your workers, teachers expect respect from their students, parents hope to receive love and respect from their children. Um, but if we're talking about being in a role of some sort of leadership role, whether you're a parent or a teacher or a boss, then I think it's really important to think, well, what is my responsibility in this role? Not necessarily what am I owed by being in this role, but what is my responsibility to others in this role? So the first thing I think of is my role as a parent. I have four small children between the ages of four and 10. And many times it's very easy to feel that if they're misbehaving, uh, if they're becoming really difficult, that I need to change them. Or they should behave better. Why can't they understand that I want them to behave well, or if I yell at them, why don't, they, why, you know, if I'm speaking louder, it should be getting the point across, right? <laughs> this is a recipe for disaster, um, because it's actually kind of a childlike way of thinking. And two immature parties in a relationship with, e with each other does not make for good results. It only escalates the tempers and it only escalates the tantrums. And I've, I've, when I've been caught in that feeling or in that frustration, I'm surprised at how much I feel like having a temper tantrum. Me. So something that Mike and I learned uh, really helped us to take a couple parenting courses and webinars is that if we don't like something that our children are doing, then we have to look at ourselves. You can bet that there's something that I need to change 
if I want something to change in my children. Because who's the responsible person in this relationship, right? It's easy to, to, to put blame or to be frustrated with kids because they're just so out there. They don't consider how they appear to other people. They're just reacting, right? And, so, and we know better, so we try, to, we try to control them in a way that still looks good on the outside, but in many ways is just, is just as childlike. So, um, so we've learned that you know, if, if there's something our children are doing, especially as small children, you know, if they're whining, or if they're arguing with each other, or if they're saying, ma, 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 a million times in a day, then, then there's something that we need to change about the way that we're responding to how they're acting, or um, about the way that we talk with them. And especially to make sure that we're not reacting in a similar childlike manner to their childlike actions. So, when I think about this and about the, the text that my friend translated, that it's a parent's responsibility to inspire a filial heart, then it's, it's, I think it's my goal that in the future, of course my children are young now, so it's a, a process, I can't make them be filial children now, but it's my goal that in the future that they cannot help but want to love and be with me and take care of me as I get older. And then in our role as pastors, I feel it's also similar. I mean, ultimately, we hope to get God's approval, <laughs> right? That, what, that we're doing a good job or that we, what we did was meaningful. But, but the people we're pastoring are our best judges. And that's all of you guys. So, um, you know, it's really helpful for us if you sincerely share that something that we're doing is, is uh, meaningful to you and that is helpful to you, then, then that's kind of affirmation for us. But it's also our goal to listen to you if you feel there's something that we're, that we're missing or that we're not addressing or that we're falling short in some way. And I think that this is what it means to be a true subject. And this is a term that is a little bit unfamiliar, but our true parents and Reverend Mrs. Moon often talked about there being a true subject and a true object. And the subject is the one who initiates and who gives love to the other, to the object. And the object receives that and, in, and naturally returns that to the subject. And then there's a relationship form. There's a natural relationship of mutual love and inter interdependence that's formed. It's the one who gives first. And if we want the best example, I think we can look at God. Because God didn't have somebody saying, oh, you should create this world. <laughs> right? God, from his own initiative and, and what we call shimjung, or like the irrepressible desire to give and receive love, created this world. And even though we, as his children, are not always the best objects, right? Sometimes we don't recognize God's love. Sometimes we don't feel God's love. Sometimes we blame God because we're not getting the kind of love that we want. But God still gives it. Right? In the Bible, it says that God makes the sun to shine on the good and the bad, and the rain to fall on the crops of the good and the bad. The God's love is, is absolute, eternal, and unchanging, and unconditional, no matter who you are. But with that g love that God gives, then there are also people who recognize it and, and like rise to fill the role of the object and to give love back to God. So this is looking from the role of, of like a leader or a subject or somebody in a role of responsibility. Now, when I'm talking about this, you might be thinking, huh, well, I don't really like the way my pastor does things actually, or those, that kind of parent doesn't sound like my kind of parents. I didn't receive 
that unconditional love as a child. I was often blamed for my actions and yelled out for, for being too loud and put in a time out when I didn't deserve it or worse. So the other side of this topic that I want to share is that if you are in the object position to somebody, this also applies. Don't blame your subject. Don't blame the person responsible for you, for your situation. Don't wait for the other person to give and then blame them if they don't. Our true father talked all the time about becoming also a true object or an absolute zero, especially in front of God, because when you can just give be a true object, it, it like creates a vacuum. There's, it's like there's nothing between you and the other person. And so what rushes to fill that? It creates a space for love. And if the person who's responsible to give it to you doesn't give it to you, God will give it to you. God will fill that space with love. So perhaps you can look back at your relationship with your parents or maybe your teachers, or maybe somebody that you looked up to, and then they, you felt they betrayed your trust and your love, you can quickly say, oh, they didn't love me, or they, they weren't a true subject. They fell short in so many ways. Well, this is, it's, I'm telling you, it's not an uncommon experience to have. This is a fallen world. People have fallen natures of selfishness and jealousy and greed. And while they, on one hand, I think we can look at our parents with this kind of compassion. We know that they did their best with what they had, but there's still the other side where, where selfishness came in the way of their love for us, or greed, or um, frustration, or, or even blame. So I know that this is everybody's experience. But as we mature our love, we can still love them. We can still give love to those who are supposed to love us. And when we love them unconditionally, it, it just creates a space for them to love us back. And I've experienced this with my own parents. My parents did a pretty good job. But there are places where I could say, well, this this wasn't right or this fell short but when i was on my missions program and i was learning about god's heart and i was learning about seeing all people from god's point of view and seeing all people as god's children not just from my relationship with them because in my relationship then mike is just my husband my parents are just my parents and there's it's just me and that person my relationship but but when i could look from god's point of view i could see everybody as a child of god and with a parental perspective, I could have compassion, and I could have forgiveness. And I found a whole new love for my parents that I, I just hadn't been awakened to it until that point. And so then when I went home to visit my parents, or when I called my parents, I started relating to them with that love, without the pain in the way, without the resentment in between us. And I found that it was like my parents were so happy to, to have a new way to relate to me. It was like they were finally able to love me in a way that they'd always wanted to love me, but there were too many things in the way. And it was like a whole new relationship of love. So, Oh, this is not mine, this is last week's, okay. There we go. Pretty go. Okay. <laughs> Too many sermon notes up here. <laughs> it's easy to look at the other person, whether they're someone above you or below you. You know, we're all in these relationships of, of sometimes we're the object to somebody and sometimes we're the subject. Sometimes we're in a role of responsibility and sometimes we're in a role to be taken care of by somebody. 
But it's easy to say, hey, you aren't giving me enough love, or you aren't giving me enough respect, or you aren't supporting me enough. But the point is to be mature enough to fulfill my responsibility towards those people in my life. And then naturally, this will inspire the other party to fulfill their responsibility to you. And if it doesn't, if they're, if they're just n too immature to be able to do that, it will inspire God to fulfill his responsibility toward you. So Jesus said, love your enemy. Most people admit that a peaceful world will come only when we love our enemies. Nonetheless, it is not easy for most of us to translate Jesus' words into action. And what I'm talking about is a very personal and very real way that we do this. We don't necessarily think of my parents as my enemy, or my pastor as my enemy, or my teacher or my boss as my enemy, though maybe some of us do. But in situations where it's difficult to love, or we don't feel that we deserve, no, that, that they don't deserve our love, that's where, we, that's where it comes in to practice loving our enemy, to give love, to be the first to give. And here's another quote. This is from the Bible, from Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So this is not easy, but this is a mature way of life. And it's something to strive for. You may find yourself thinking, well, that sounds nice, but there's just some people I can't forgive. There's just some people that I cannot, I cannot think about giving love to. I want to say that's okay. From God's perspective as a parent, God knows where each one of us are at. God knows the situations that we're in. God knows the pain that we faced. And God has compassion for us and acceptance for us where we're at. However, I do want to put this out there as something to strive for. even if you're just struggling with the concept of it, but that's okay. So what I recommend is to start being the first to give love in any relationships that you can give love in. With, with maybe with your spouse or your children, somebody that you do love and you, you want to love. But I think even in our own relationships of people that we love, we often find ourselves being a little lazy or waiting for somebody else to initiate something or to give love first. I really challenge you to be the first to give love in any relationship that you can, whether it's serving another person, helping them out with a task, by expressing your love for them. Sometimes love just needs to be expressed. Or forgiving another person. I challenge you to practice that this week and see what happens. I'm telling you, the, the end of this week will look different if you be the first to give love than if you didn't. And I think it's these small experiences, maybe where you feel a little bit more comfortable first, where if you give love first, you, you can see how things can change or develop or blossom so quickly. And once you get comfortable with this, once it starts to become a practice, not necessarily a practice, but habit, a natural way of life to just give first, then I think it won't be such a stretch to give love to the unlovable. When you see the results of it happening in your own life, in your own family, with the people that you love, 
it's like it's like a it's like the roof gets blown off and you realize the transformative power of true love and then maybe you get the courage it inspires you to take that step to love somebody who's really hard to love I have a couple more quotes here Evil is acting for selfish gain, whereas goodness is to serve others and let go of the memory of having done so. When we give and forget, true love flourishes. We do not run out of love by giving it away. Quite the opposite. True love is a spring that flows anew in ever greater abundance. When walking the path of love, even when you give something precious, you feel that you did not give enough. And here's one more. The fallen world programs us to think that when we give something away, it is gone. In true love, however, the more we give, the more we receive. When our mindset changes from wishing to receive love to wishing to give love, the world of peace will be at hand. So just to recap, this is love for the responsibility that in all the relationships that we're in, whether they are romantic relationships, or work relationships, or school relationships, or community relationships, actually, these should be love relationships. And for me to recognize that I have a responsibility in these relationships, whether I am the head of the organization, or I'm at the, the lowest rung, I can be the first to give, and that is my role and responsibility when she said in, in that first paragraph that love practiced with responsibility is true love. That's when boundaries are overcome, transformation takes place. And I also want to remind you not to look at the other side and see the failures or the faults or the love that's not being given, but instead to think, what can I do here? So. With that, I'm going to offer a prayer to finish up. Turn it off. Heavenly Parent, good morning. Thank you so much for a beautiful, beautiful morning. We're so grateful that so many of us could be gathered here together, even just once a week, to share in your love and to open up our hearts to you. And I pray that we can come not just to listen to words or just to see friends, but really to look at our life. We don't come here just to listen to words. We come here to be transformed. We come here to become a new person, Heavenly Parent. And you know where we're at. You know if we're ready for it or not. But I pray that with each one of us, you can find the cracks in our hard hearts sometimes and open up that door so that we can take the next step in our life to becoming more like you, to resembling your love to the people in our lives and, ex and experiencing what your love truly is. We talk about love and love is a word thrown around so casually that many of us and many people in this country and in this world don't even know what true love is supposed to feel like, supposed to taste like, and what the action of that actually looks like heavenly parent but you want to show us that you want us to be renewed by the experience of true love in our life and so i pray that we can take these words to heart and find some way to be the first to give this week and i offer this prayer in my name michael and donia hendrick a blessed family amen and adieu thank you